Before we look at individual local anaesthetics, there are a few basic points to make about them. They can be either amides or esters. Amides have a longer half-life and are metabolised in the liver, whereas esters are inactivated by esterases in the plasma and liver, and so have a much more rapid offset. You can tell which of these two groups any local anaesthetic falls into just by looking at the prefix in its name. If the prefix has the letter I in it, it's an amide, like lidocaine, bupivacaine, prilocaine, and ropivacaine. If it doesn't have an I in the prefix, it's an ester, like procaine, cocaine, and tetracaine. Now let's look at their mechanism of action. Local anaesthetics inhibit voltage-gated sodium channels of neuronal axons to inhibit the propagation of action potentials, and they do this preferentially at thin neurons, which are the ones that carry pain and temperature sensation. They're all weak bases, so we represented the local anaesthetic here with a B, and they exist in equilibrium with their conjugate acid. The local anaesthetic must be in its unionized form to cross the lipid bilayer of neuronal axons. As you know, the pH at which the ionized concentration is equal to the unionized concentration is known as the drug's pKa. So both the drug's pKa and also the pH of the surrounding tissues will influence how quickly the local anaesthetic can cross that lipid bilayer and exert its effect in the neuron. A low pKa and a high tissue pH will increase the speed of onset of a local anaesthetic because more of it will be in the unionized form. That's why in acidic and flamed tissues, local anaesthetic doesn't work as well. Once inside the cell, the local anaesthetic must return to its ionized form to inhibit the voltage-gated sodium channels, thus inhibiting the propagation of the action potential and transmission of pain signals. It's also worth mentioning what exactly determines the duration of action of a local anaesthetic. Plasma protein binding actually correlates very well with sodium channel affinity, and so the protein binding of a local anaesthetic is a very good indicator of how long it's going to work for. Now we've already discussed the fact that local anaesthetics preferentially inhibit voltage-gated sodium channels in neurons carrying pain and temperature sensation. But there are other excitable tissues in which voltage-gated sodium channels are abundant. So if too high a dose of local anaesthetic is given, toxicity will present with both neurological and cardiac effects. Neurological ones tend to present first, with symptoms such as perioral paresthesia, dizziness, tinnitus, visual disturbances, confusion, shivering, and even seizures. Cardiac effects tend to manifest after neurological ones. Local anaesthetics prolong the phase zero of the cardiomyocyte action potential and so cause dysrhythmias, myocardial depression, and this can progress to ventricular fibrillation. In the event of cardiac arrest from local anaesthetic toxicity, intralipid should be given in line with AAGBI guidelines. Let's look more specifically now at two of the more common local anaesthetics that you'll be using in your practice.